more mass shootings and midterm fallout. We saw bodies. It was hard. We're going through very, very difficult days today and in the days ahead, but, but we will get through this. After mass shootings in Colorado and Virginia, Americans are again in mourning over gun violence this Thanksgiving week. And the reason we're losing is because Donald Trump has put himself before everybody else. A growing number of high profile Republicans call on the party to move on from the former president. Plus, I hereby part, yes. I hereby pardon chocolate and chip. President Biden kicks off this holiday season at the White House next. This is Washington Week. Corporate funding is provided by... For 25 years, Consumer Cellular's goal has been to provide wireless service that helps people communicate and connect. We offer a variety of no-contract plans, and our U.S.-based customer service team can help find one that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Additional funding is provided by Koo and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Once again, from Washington, moderator Yamish Alcindor. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. Tonight, we begin with the heartbreaking series of mass shootings this Thanksgiving week. Last weekend in Colorado Springs, a gunman opened fire inside a nightclub, long considered to be a safe space for the LGBTQ community within the historically conservative city. At least five people were killed there and more than a dozen others injured. And then on Tuesday night in Chesapeake, Virginia, another gunman killed at least six people and injured others at a Walmart. According to the Gun Violence Archive, a nonprofit that tracks mass shootings, in the U.S. just this year, there have been more than 600 mass shootings. It's just incredible to think about. Joining me tonight to discuss this and more, Tolu Onoripa, the White House bureau chief for The Washington Post, Dave Phillips, a national correspondent for The New York Times, he's in Colorado Springs. And here at the table, Susan Page, the Washington bureau chief at USA Today, and Heidi Presvola, a national investigative correspondent for Politico. So thank you all for being here. Dave, I want to start with you. You're there. You've been on the ground covering that mass shooting that happened in your hometown, Colorado Springs. Tell us what happened with this shooting and how patrons at that nightclub fought back. You know, it's, it's uh, really a sad but incredible story. It was midnight on a, a Saturday night, and uh, the gunman came in and just immediately started uh, shooting very rapidly with a high-power assault rifle. Uh, he killed five and injured about 18 others. But what's remarkable about this is within a minute of when he started shooting, a, a 45-year-old combat veteran who was there uh, with his wife and his, his grown daughter uh, watching a, a drag performance, he tackled the shooter, and with the help of other patrons, they uh, essentially beat him with his own gun and held him down until the police arrived, something like three minutes later. So it was one of the rare instances where a, a shooting like this happens that could have been so much worse if, if people hadn't immediately responded and taken a lot of risk. I mean, they took so many risks. They were their heroes when I was just reading about your stories and so many other interviews that these patrons have been giving. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the significance of this happening in Colorado Springs, given the history of that city as being an anti-LGBTQ, at times, conservative um, space in, historically. Well, that's right. I, Colorado Springs, especially um, during the 1990s, was really a center of not just uh, conservative Christianity, but really an organized conservative Christian political movement that sought to limit the rights of gays and lesbians and, and do other things, um, you know, to try and remake the world, you know, according to the values they wanted to see. Now, that was a long time ago, and they, they have waned in influence as the city has grown, but this is still a very, very conservative community. Uh, Republicans outnumber Democrats, registered Democrats, two to one. 
Uh, and so the, the club where the shooting happened, Club Q, had really become more than just a, a bar or a dance club. It was a community center in a lot of ways for, for this town of 500,000, a place where people could come together and, and have that community that they didn't really see reflected in, in the larger culture and have a safe space. And talking about safe spaces, I mean, the other thing, Susan, is, of course, there's a shooting in Virginia at Walmart. Anyone who's shopped anywhere, I said, sort of gave me chills just thinking about you. You're going about your day, and then there's this terrible shooting. I want to point to the statistic that stopped me dead in my tracks when I was preparing for the show. Not a single week in 2022 has passed without at least four mass shootings. That's according to The Washington Post. What are you hearing from your sources, the White House, Capitol Hill, about how to prevent this from continuing to happen like this? And, of course, most of those cases we never hear about. We never read about them. Uh, they have become something that's of interest to the individual community uh, where it happens. And yet there is clearly no safe space for Americans to go to. You can't to go to elementary schools, you go to shops, you go to churches, you go to grocery stores. These have all been the sites of horrific uh, mass shootings. And yet the debate over gun control, how many times have we said that that's stalemated? There was legislation passed and signed by President Biden in June that did something to provide incentives for states to have red flag laws, for instance, uh, increased background checks for young people. But the idea of more serious gun measures that would, say, get assault weapons out of the hands of shooters is just something that we don't seem to have the political will to do. And, and Tolu, you're at the White House, of course. What are you hearing from White House officials um, that are sitting down with their families on Thanksgiving, but also thinking about all of the other families now that are sitting down at a Thanksgiving table without their loved ones? Well, President Biden was elected in part because he was someone who knows how to empathize with the American people in 2020. There were a lot of people who had empty seats at their Thanksgiving table because of the pandemic and because of a number of different things. And now he's having to deal with the fact that there are a number of people who have empty seats at the, th at the Thanksgiving table because of gun violence. And he has touted the law that Su Susan mentioned that was passed earlier this year, bipartisan uh, gun law that you know, the first time that happened in more than 30 years. But it was a limited law that will not prevent a lot of these mass shootings because uh, there are a number of things that the president and Democrats wanted, including an assault weapons ban, that Republicans were not going to go along with. And so the White House has said that President Biden continues to be optimistic about the idea of an assault weapons ban. It's hard to square that with the political reality of the fact that the White House is not going to be uh, able to pass much legislation in the next two years because Republicans are going to uh, be in charge of the House, and they have said that they do not want to pass additional laws, especially on gun rights. And so it's hard to see where that optimism is coming from, and it's hard to see exactly what powers the president might have to be able to restrict uh, access to guns by people who would want to do harm to people on a mass scale because uh, it's hard to do any of that through executive authority. You have to pass laws, and it's very difficult to pass gun laws uh, in this country, especially in a divided government, which we're about to go into. Certainly. And Heidi, you've been covering two beats that I think are, are so central to what we're talking about. You've been covering education, but also really the conspiracy theory beat, if that's a beat we can even call it that. Um, because, And I bring that up because with the, with the Colorado Springs shooting, there are a lot of people in the LGBTQ community who are saying part of why they're feeling targeted and why their lives are more in danger is because of the rhetoric, frankly, coming from the right with conspiracy theories saying that some LGBTQ people want to brainwash children. What are you hearing? There's been a huge investment just over the past couple of years of shifting the culture wars to this issue of LGBTQ in the community. You look at just the number of bills that have been introduced in state legislatures, the most ever. Uh, you look at the rhetoric that's coming from some of the right-wing outlets. Um, and, of course, this community feels feels threatened. And then you see something like this. At the same time, those same communities and individuals who are making these statements uh, aren't, there's no mea culpa here. Listen to what Herschel Walker said. He doubled down. He said, people who can't tell the difference between a man and a woman are the enemy. He said this after the shooting. So this is a, this is a huge concern because we not only have a gun problem in this country, that's been longstanding. We have increasingly what many are calling a domestic terrorism problem that is really being cultivated and radicalized on the far right by individuals who believe that story time for children ages three to eight, where they're singing, if you're happy and you know it, 
clap your hands, uh, that that's, that's sexualizing children. But there's, there's a through line here too, Yamish, and that is if you realize, if you remember, even going back to the campaign, it's almost as if many on the right are trying to make anyone who is their opponent or anyone who is their opponent politically or in the cultural wars into a pedophile. They were suggesting that Joe Biden was a pedophile. They called Mallory McMorrow, who's a, a Michigan legislature, in the Michigan legislature, a groomer. And so there's this, this almost dystopian Russian uh, uh, style attempt to smear people as pedophiles because it's the one thing that is universally abhorrent yeah. is pedophilia, right? And there's also the 2024 <laughs> politics. I'm thinking of Secretary Mike Pompeo, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who said that the most dangerous person in the world is Ryan Wangard. Of course, she's the head of the Federation of Teachers. She's a teacher's union. Talk about how 2024 politics are, are, are playing in here. Because we talk about fringe right, but also some mainstream Republicans are talking about this, too. Well, this is also cutting into the suburban vote as well. If you look at what happened in Virginia with Glenn Youngkin, that battle was really fought on school boards and on the notion that for instance, critical race theory is being taught in schools. I did a lot of reporting on that. I did not find any evidence of what critical race theory is other than teaching accurate history of about segregation, Jim Crow, slavery. Um, some people yeah. feel that that's making white kids feel guilty or bad and that that is therefore critical race theory. But this is touching a nerve, uh, again, folks stoking the cultural, rose, cultural wars, shifting the front the battleground now to schools, whether it's LGBTQ uh, and, and accusing people of, of grooming children or these uh, debates over critical race theory. This is where they're trying to have the battlefront. And, and Dave, you're there in Colorado. Um, it's seen some of the country's worst mass shootings. I wonder what you're hearing on the ground from people about what can prevent this, but also what we've all been talking about, which is that Washington doesn't really have possibly an answer for these local communities. Right. You know, what we heard again and again is frustration that uh, this is not a, a um, unique problem or a new problem, but one that, you know, everyone is so used to that when someone came in and started shooting with a, a military style weapon in this bar, the patrons immediately knew that they had to attack him. They had seen this play out before. And what are they saying? You know what I heard? over and over again when um, I tried to report on, you know, is this a, a hate crime? Is this a question of targeting the LGBTQ community? A lot of people in that community said to me, like, hey, look, this is more than anything a gun violence problem. We're never going to be able to make everybody love us, but at least we could try to make things a little safer so that, you know, dozens of people are not shot. Mm. Dave, I, thank you so much for sharing your reporting on the ground there. It's so important to have you. I appreciate you making your Washington Week debut. Now, back here in Washington, a rift is growing among Republicans over the party's current and future leaders. Republican leader Kevin McCarthy's bid to become House Speaker is in jeopardy. Last week, he won enough votes to be nominated for the role by his party, but he still needs to get 218 votes on the House floor. And so far, it's just not clear he can get that many because some Republicans, mostly from the House Freedom Caucus, have said they will not support him. This all comes as the chorus of prominent Republicans calling on the party to put former President Trump, that's Donald Trump, of course, behind them is getting louder. Let's stop supporting crazy, unelectable candidates in our primaries and start getting behind winners that can close the deal in November. I am a never again Trumper. Why? Because I want to win and we lose with Trump. It was really clear to us in 18, in 20, and now in 2022. Still, Trump remains popular among many in the GOP base, which will be critical to winning the 2024 presidential nomination. So Susan, back to you, you interviewed former Vice President Mike Pence. What did your interview reveal about what Mike Pence thinks about the future of the Republican Party and maybe his own ambitions? Well, Mike Pence thinks there is an opening for himself and that there, the, the era of Trump and voters just might be willing and able at this point to say that's over. Now, he may turn out to be wrong about that, but he sees an opening for himself. He is critical of Trump, not Trump policies, but of Trump himself in a way he, of course, never was as vice president. And you do hear a rising chorus, as we just heard uh, from people like former Speaker Ryan and from former uh, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, a willingness to criticize Trump that we have not seen 
since he won the nomination in 2016. Is that enough to convince Republican voters to defeat Trump in a primary, to choose somebody else, Ron DeSantis or whoever, as their nominee? I don't think we know that yet, but we know that, that there is a new vulnerability surrounding Donald Trump that wasn't there before. I also have to ask you, Vice President, or former Vice President Mike Pence, he was pretty hard on the January 6th committee in other interviews. He was also saying that he doesn't, he was at least saying, in, at least in part, when asked, does Trump bear some criminal responsibility, he says, well, it's not, he's not sure because Trump was listening to bad lawyers. What do you make of that, given the fact that Mike Pence was running for his life on January 6th? Yeah, his life, his family's life, and in, in put in peril by the president, by the former president. Uh, well, I think Mike Pence is trying to have it both ways. He's trying to be critical. Of, he's trying to defend the action he took on January 6th, uh, which so uh, dismayed Donald Trump, while also appealing to Trump voters. And that is threading a needle that I think is uh, very difficult indeed, and we'll see if he can do that. And, and Tolu, we, of course, covered former President Trump together, some, some interesting days we had together. I wonder if you could talk about how real you think this break from Donald Trump, or at least this attempted break from Donald Trump is, given the fact that we've seen Republicans sort of go away and then come right back at times to Trump when it's clear that the base is still with him. Yeah, Yamish, you remember the former president when he was uh, running for president in 2016 and when he became president, he told voters and Americans that they would never get tired of winning. And now, after successive losses uh, for the Republican Party in 2018 and 2020 and 2022, uh, there are a number of Republicans that are getting tired of losing, and they are being open about criticizing the former president, criticizing his picks in some of these primary races, criticizing his broader political philosophy that is turning off a lot of suburban and moderate voters. Now, as you mentioned, the president continues to have uh, support among his base. He continues to be the one Republican who can bring out thousands of people to gather and, and rally for him. And so that is a formidable thing in the Republican caucus, especially uh, at a time when the party uh, is somewhat fractured, doesn't have a lot of alternatives, and has a number of people that are trying to be that alternative. And when you have multiple people splitting a vote against President Trump, former President Trump, who has his base that is going to be with him no matter what, he could have a glide path to the nomination just based on the fact that even if you get 30 percent or 35 percent and they are rock hard rock-solid supporters, and you have five other people who are also running for the nomination who split up that vote, it can be difficult for anyone else to stand a chance. So I would not count the former president out as a formidable Republican uh, potential nominee, as someone who continues to lead the party in a number of different ways and continues to have a sway over everyone in the party, especially in Congress. And so, briefly, uh, Tulu, I, I want to ask you, yet, if you could, people are. what do you make of former President Trump also sort of continuing to punch back. What does that tell you about sort of his plan, briefly, if you could? Yeah, he will continue to be the fighter, the pugnacious uh, former president that he has been, uh, as long as he's been a politician, as long as he's been a businessman. He wants to punch back harder than anyone could punch him. So he's looking and taking names, and I would expect him to be very vicious towards other Republicans who try to cross him and try to take advantage of the fact that there are a number of people who don't see him as strong as he was when he was president. And, and Heidi, we are seeing some Republican donors say they don't want to be with him, uh, but you're also seeing this sort of grassroots effort to vilify anyone who sort of goes against his election deniers. I'm thinking about Arizona, where you have Bill Gates, who was who, who is it was a, a high-ranking official there working in the election system. He had to go into basically hiding because of what was happening with people attacking him. What does that sort of tell you about the, where the Republican Party is? Well, look, a lot of these folks lost the election deniers in positions of authority, such as governor or overseeing elections, but they didn't lose by much. And there are a lot of people who feel very strongly um, and believe, in fact, that the elections are rigged and are, are being stolen. I was out there in Arizona at a polling precinct where one of the tabulators just wasn't printing accurate tick marks, and a gentleman came outside who identified himself as a poll worker and started working up the crowd about how maybe their their ballots wouldn't be counted if they were put in to the ballot box, which was unbelievable, given this has always been the process that they do. But it, the point, to answer your question, is that it's, it's pervasive. Um, a lot of these folks lost, uh, but what was that? 
Why was that? Was it because Trump wasn't there drumming it up and supporting them every step of the way? There's a lot of indication, based on my reporting, that because he was quiet and these folks were kind of out on a limb in the end there, they all just conceded, but it could have gone, it could have gone so very differently. Yeah. But, but I got to say, the best thing that happened in this election, to my mind, is there were 13 people running in the six battleground states for jobs that would have given them oversight of elections. Yeah. 13 of the 13 lost. And, you know, we've got some election deniers elected in uh, re safely Republican states. That's not a great thing, but it's not so dangerous. The idea that we did not, we as a country, did not elect election deniers in the states that will determine the next presidential race is, I think, the most important thing that happened it's on huge. election day. It's huge. Um, some of them were elected to Congress. We have, like, a much higher number in Congress right now. But to Susan's point, they are not in positions of authority to oversee elections in 2024, which it makes a huge difference. Yeah. And we may have really averted a constitutional yeah. crisis. And I want to, of course, turn to the other thing that we, we talked about at the beginning of this, which is um, part, part, part of the fallout of the midterms is that Kevin McCarthy, Susan, <laughs> is going to have a time of his life getting these 218 votes to be House Speaker. What's your sense of his strategy to get there? And what might happen if he doesn't get those votes? Well, he's going to work pretty hard between now and January 3rd because he's got just no cushion. He's got no room for error. And we, we'll see what kind of commitments he needs to make to the Freedom Caucus and to others to nail down their votes. I think it is entirely possible he's not elected speaker. Because, you know, you don't need to defeat him with somebody. You just need to deny him a majority of those present and voting. And at the moment, if the election were today, he wouldn't get there. He wouldn't get there. Uh, Tola, we only have about 30 seconds left, but I want to just bring you in. What's your sense of how the White House is viewing all of this, given the fact that President Biden is trying to figure out how to deal with his agenda as all of this plays out? Yeah, you hear from White House uh, officials that President Biden has worked with members of the Republican Party in the past, that he's passed more than 200 bipartisan bills during the first two years. So they are optimistic that they'll be able to get things done, but they're also bracing for impact because they know Republicans want to investigate everything about his administration and his family. And so they are waiting to see how aggressive the Republicans will be when it comes to the oversight of the Biden administration. And Heidi, the, the slim majority that Republicans have, it mirrors the slim majority um, that, that Democrats have. I, I, think, I find that so interesting that our country is sort of swinging, but just a little to this side and then a little to that side. What do you make of that? Well, with redistricting, it probably would be very different if we didn't have the maps drawn the way that they're drawn. Um, and I think we need to look at the popular vote in, in terms of making those determinations. But um, look, to Toulouse's point, they're going to use that to just do the investigations because this majority... Uh, is going to make the Tea Party look like they were really easy to manage for John Boehner. Just the concessions that they're going to demand of McCarthy, if he makes it, he's already had to cut a deal with Marjorie Taylor Greene, who's now saying, telling everyone, I'm, look, I'm going to have a lot of power. And you see him already going back on some of the things that yeah. he said, like impeaching Mayorkas. Yeah. Yeah, well, a lot to definitely watch. Um, thanks so much to our panelists for joining us and for sharing your reporting. And be sure to tune in Saturday to PBS News Weekend with college football rivalries underway. They take a look at the effect name, image, and licensing rights are having on collegiate sports. And finally, on this Thanksgiving holiday weekend, all of us at Washington Week, we're grateful for you, our viewers, for joining us each week. We hope you're celebrating this holiday weekend with those you love most. I'm Yamiche. I'll send her a good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week is provided by Consumer Cellular. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. You're watching PBS.